Okay, it's 12.15 on a Tuesday, and that means that it is time for <laughs> Ask Jess, all things clutter. Ask Jess is my video podcast where I talk to you about all things related to clutter and all different types of clutter. I believe that all clutter in our life is connected, so if you're dealing with physical clutter in your house, we can also address it by dealing with emotional clutter, financial clutter, social clutter, all the other types of clutter. I also believe that we were never taught the skills to deal with clutter in our world today because our world is so full of stuff, and so it's my goal to teach you these skills. All this month, we're talking about how to live with other people and their clutter. It's very difficult, um, but, <laughs> hi Karen, but it is possible to live with other people and still love them despite all the stuff they have. So kids, right off the bat, come with so much stuff, right? So you have a baby, and before you even bring this baby into your house, your house is full of stuff for this baby, right? So you bring this little baby, this little like eight pound baby home into a world, their own world that's already like chock full of things. So my best advice when we're going to start, we're going to go like <laughs> from like baby on, right? Okay. My best advice for babies is to buy as little as possible and this is one area where I think you can really, really buy used. There is so much baby clothing, baby equipment, baby gear, baby everything in this world today. And babies don't really use a lot of their stuff. They wear some clothing. They might, you know, sit in a swing or whatever, but their things don't get destroyed. They're used for a really short period of time because babies grow so quickly so if you have a baby, if you're planning to have a baby, find sources for used stuff. I think you could pretty much outfit your entire child with free used things. You can search on Facebook. Um, you could ask all of your friends. There's a lot of babies consignment, like baby and kid consignment sales. So seek those out and just commit to like having this one area of development be an area where you're just buying used saving money and because and all the other thing with babies is that you never know what's going to work for them like you never know which type of bottle is going to work you know what they're going to kind of be drawn to so you tend to overbuy because you might need this or you might need that so buy used so that's and buy as little as possible because honestly babies need like very little so as kids kind of start to get older an interesting thing to note is by the age of two, children start to feel a special attachment to certain items. So you know how we have emotional attachments to things that prevent us from getting rid of whatever? Babies or toddlers do also. That starts like around the age of, you know, 18 months to two where they really start to, kids start to get attached to like a lovey. So it's interesting to note that already as babies, we're holding emotional attachment to things. By the age of six to eight, kids start to develop collections of items. And collecting things for a child is really a positive because it helps them to learn skills of organization, um, categorization, and just to just kind of like take care of stuff. Um, the problem is that we end up collecting too much stuff, right? And especially with toys for children, there's a lot of toys that have a lot of accessories. I mean, there you know, you get like one toy and it has like 400 little accessories. So kids' collections tend to be really ridiculously large. Um, one of the questions that I had before this, uh, this podcast was, how do I know what toys are really important to my child's development? I thought that this was a super interesting question. And I remember when my kids were babies, um, there was like those baby Einstein videos were really popular and everyone was saying, you know, you have to get these baby Einstein videos because they're going to make your child a genius. And it turns out that baby Einstein, the company was actually sued because they were misleading people with their claims, with their marketing. Turns out you can't make your child a genius by watching baby Einstein videos. So I posted this question on my Facebook page earlier this week. Was there any single toy that actually 
in retrospect, you feel as a parent enhanced your child's development or made them smarter or made them hit their milestones earlier. The, there were a couple of toys that came up like books, Legos and puzzles came up frequently as a toy that a parent could look back on and say, this really helped my child's development. There were also a couple of toys that came up a couple of times like gross motor skill toys like balance bikes um, that people thought was were really helpful to their kids. But far and wide, people responded that no, there was like nothing that really, no single toy really helps their child become smarter or hit their milestones earlier or really enhanced their development. So if you are in this stage of life where you have children that are really young um, and you're considering purchasing stuff for them because you want to make sure that they are reading on time or doing math on time or you know whatever it is, rest assured that parents of you know slightly older children will definitely tell you that there's no single toy that can do that. Um, and of course, there's a lot of research that backs that up too. The best thing that you can do for your kids if you want them to develop is to let them go outside and play. Um, like free interactive play is the best thing for children. So as kids kind of get older, their clutter begin, becomes like, it starts to feel really burdensome to us because we start to take care of their clutter. And when I think about clutter and decluttering as a whole, I really feel like we think about decluttering as like a big event, like something that we have to do every so often and it's something that nobody looks forward to. But because we live in this world that is so full of so much stuff, we need to change the way that we think about decluttering and make it part of our routine household tasks, right? So we clutter, decluttering is not like a serious, like weekend long, event that you have to like clear your schedule for. It's just like doing laundry or doing the dishes or picking up. Decluttering is really something that has to be done regularly because we have so much stuff coming into our houses. We've never had this much stuff before, right? So with children, we really want to make this part of their kind of chores and their responsibilities as children growing up. And chores, responsibilities, Clutter, this is all a very kind of gray area for adults. So I just want to talk a little bit about the benefit of having chores for your children um, and then how we can kind of um, build clutter into that whole or decluttering or dealing with their stuff into their whole mindset with chores. So chores are really important for children um, because for many reasons, but the ones that I really think are critical it, chores help children believe that they're capable of doing stuff. They teach kids to take care of themselves. They help children develop empathy, and also it helps kids to build self-esteem when they have chores. So that's because they receive you know, praise and, and positive feedback from the people who matter the most to them. So you're, pa you're their parents, right? You matter the most to your children. So when you praise them for doing a good job, that really builds their self-esteem because your praise is critically important to them. It also gives children a sense of belonging because it makes them feel like an actual valued member of a community. So the immediate family is the first community that your child is a part of. And when they feel like they are a critical and valued part member of this community, it's huge for their sense of worth. I actually read a study once that linked um, chores that children had, or like responsibilities that children had at younger ages to feeling a sense of worth and value throughout high school, which we know is a really tricky time for any person. So chores are really important and building, decluttering and dealing with their own possessions into the ch your children's chores is a really good way to start to deal with their clutter. So how do you do that? Um, I think, you know, <laughs> I've thought, I've tried to, I've th thought about this a lot. And I've, I've thought about chores and decluttering. So when it comes to giving kids chores, my, my sense of all of this is we want to provide the structure for them to be able to do chores well. And then, you know, you wouldn't expect anybody to just have a skill suddenly, right? You have to kind of build up to it. So when I was teaching my kids how to take care of their clothing, which is part of their clutter, right? 
the first thing when they were younger was just simply putting your clothing into a hamper. Like that's step one. So my expectation for my younger kids was just get your clothing into the hamper, right? That's, that's all I want you to do. Then I want you to be able to sort your clothing. So no, this is, these are t-shirts, these are socks, these are whatever, and have an idea of where that stuff lives in your bedroom. So where do your t-shirts go? Where do your long pants go? Um, so you can get yourself dressed. So then after they're like putting their clothing into the hamper successfully, they're able to identify where different categories of clothing that belong to them go. Then the next step is really putting clothing away. I have a saying, done is better than perfect. So a lot of times with chores, we feel like, you know, it's impossible to have kids help because they don't do it right. But you want to kind of shift that mindset because really just getting it done is better than doing it perfect. So when my kids were learning how to put their laundry away, I did not care if it was folded or not. I just wanted them to have the responsibility for getting it from the clean hamper into the right drawer. And honestly, their clothing was never super wrinkled or anything. I mean, it's little kids clothing. So the next step was just to make, just to get them to get their clothing into the right drawer. And the success rate with this was a kind of hit or miss for a while, but once they really were able to take their clothing from you know, their clean hamper and put it into the correct drawer, then I started to teach them how to fold their clothing. And one thing at a time, you start with the easy thing, like the pants. And then once they can fold pants, then you add, you know, t-shirts, which are harder. So you really want to think of chores as like a step by step by step by step and get rid of the idea that it has to be perfect. It really just has to be done and not rushed and, you know, honor the child's process to getting it done. So at this point now, I have a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old. My 13-year-old is completely responsible for her laundry, 100%. She takes it down when it needs to be done. She puts it through the washer and dryer. She folds it. She puts it away. My 10-year-old is almost there, except that she, <laughs> she can't reach the bottom of the washer. I can barely reach the bottom of the washer. She really can't reach the bottom of the washer, so she needs a little help just transferring her clothing from the washer to the dryer. But, you know, at 10, she can pretty much do the entire thing. Her folding isn't perfect, but done is better than perfect. And she has complete responsibility over all of her clothing. So you want to think about dealing with clutter in the same sort of way, like having your kids deal with their own stuff. You want to provide a really good framework and structure for them to be successful within this model. So if I had expected a five-year-old to do their laundry completely from start to finish, they would never be successful within that model because that's just too much for them. But when it comes to clutter, like how do we create success within uh, this framework in our house? So one thing that's really important is that our kids don't have more stuff than adequately fits into their, than comfortably fits into their storage. So if they have, you know, 50 t-shirts, but their drawer for t-shirts really only comfortably holds 25 t-shirts, and we expect them to put their t-shirts away, we're setting them up for failure because they can't actually put their t-shirts away in that storage. So the same thing with toys or with whatever collections they have, they're never going to be able to clean up at all successfully if it's impossible for them to actually put their stuff away. So you want to teach your children that this, you know, X, they have X amount of space for all of their stuff. And anytime they want to add to that, they have to get rid of something. So this is you as the adult providing the framework that will enable them to be successful in dealing with their own stuff. There's also, as your kids grow and mature, you know, you might take... Hi, Debbie. <laughs> um, you might take, like, when they're younger, you might be responsible for 95% of their stuff. But as they get older, you're responsible for less and less and less, assuming that they're living within this, living successfully within this framework that you're providing. So you're responsible for the framework. They are responsible for the appropriate level of responsibility within that framework. I hope that makes sense. Um, my other, I have one more thought and then I have a question also to answer. 
Um, so when it comes to teens and technology, this is another area that's really complicated for raising kids today. And we, of course, never had this modeled for us when we were children because we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have any of this technology. So I recently went to a talk by a, an, a brain development expert um, and her advice, her number one piece of advice was that you should never allow your children to charge their electronics in their rooms. So at night they should be, now she said they should be locked up being charged like <laughs> in your bedroom. Um, but what we do in our house is we have a charging station that's in the kitchen and everything, all of the electronics at a certain time at night have to be in that charging station charging and that's where they stay for the night. Um, and I'm pretty confident that my kids are not getting up in the middle of the night and pulling their cell phones out. So that's really, with electronics, the rule is in the charging station at night and if it doesn't go in the charging station and you don't get it the next day your phone or you know whatever it is so just that's like the best advice for teens and electronics is to keep it, them away from their electronics in the middle of the night because they have a tendency like any of us do to wake up turn on their phone get involved in some social media situation and that can be very problematic um, I also had a really good question from Meredith. I don't know if you're on here, Meredith, but your question was about how do we decide, okay, how do you determine what special toys to keep to pass along to your kids when they are grown, especially toys that were gifted from grandparents? So this is a great question. Basically, you're talking about toys <laughs> that your children had that then turn into memorabilia that you wanna hang on to and then pass along. So this is a collection. Anytime we have a collection of items in our house, we first wanna decide how much space we are willing to devote to this collection. So in this case, you might think, I, it would be appropriate to pass along to my children when they're adults, one bin or two bins or whatever it is worth of stuff and then you are gonna stick to that amount of space as your parameter for how much you can keep to pass along to them. So I think you mentioned that they have train sets and maybe Kiva blocks, I forget what the other things were, that their grandparents gave them and you would really like to hang on to them. So as long as you are okay with having a certain, you know, with staying within this defined amount of space, then I think you can just kind of negotiate the collection and what stays and what goes, as long as it's not taking over that amount of space. And that's basically, any time you have a collection, you wanna first decide the parameter of space and then decide what stays that can live comfortably within that space. So this is also applicable to um, things that come home from school during the year. So I consider my children's schoolwork and artwork for each year to be an individual collection. And during the year, as it comes in, I do a quick sort, like anything that's obviously garbage, I throw out. But everything else I keep in a bin until the end of the year. At the end of the year, that collection is now theoretically complete, and it just needs to be kind of whittled down to fit into the storage that I have for them for the stuff that they keep for you know from school. So I actually sit with them and we go through everything from the year. They tell me what's important to them. I, you know, pick a few of my favorites and then we just keep a very small amount from each year. So that's, you know, that's how you think about collections and space. So, oh, I have one more tip here <laughs> that I forgot about. When kids are little and they can't read, a very good way to help them clean up is if you have bins that you use for storage or boxes or shelves, is to have like a picture, a Polaroid picture or a picture that you print out from the internet and tape it onto the bin so it's very clear to them what goes in that bin. So like have a picture of Legos on the Lego bin, have a picture of dolls on the doll bin, you know, like whatever it is. Um, pictures help kids to really put stuff away before they're able to read. So I'm just gonna go look through these comments. If anybody has any questions, feel free to just write a question in. Um, Debbie, it sounds like um, 
this this might be a little bit of a struggle with your daughter and her clean laundry. <laughs> Sometimes you need to just with teens let them have you know as figure out the like baseline that you're comfortable with and as long as they are not living in like squalor <laughs> right below your comfort level then let them have a little bit of ownership over this process because oftentimes if they know how to do laundry they know how to put it away they have those skills and they're choosing not to do it and they're a teenager there might be something else going on there there's this is probably part of a bigger emotional development minds milestone so as long as you are okay with the clutter staying in their room um, and there's not like food and animals um, you know figure out what your like baseline is of comfort and just stick with it I wouldn't like battle over clothing if that's you know, if she has the skills and she knows how to do it and she's just choosing not to, that might not be the place to have the bot battle if you can just close the door. If she's doing her own laundry, fully taking care of it, then, you know, might just need to kind of let it go. So anyway, I am going to log off here. Catch me next week, uh, Tuesday at 12.15 for another Ask Jess. And thank you guys so much for being here.